today I wanted to talk about um, uh, something I've been researching ever since I got back from my case. Um, it is um, a case in York County, Maine, where Clifford Scott, a deputy sheriff at the time, a 230-pound guy, beat up this 95-foot um, um, woman, uh, Dorothy La Fortune. And uh, it's a pretty compelling story, let me tell you. Uh, I've been looking into it, I've been reading about it. Um, Dorothy is uh, a very vocal person, uh, very outspoken about corruption in Maine. And um, <clears throat> she had a radio program back in the, in the 80s. Um, and um, it was taken off the air just before this happened. Um, but let's see if we can get more people on the live stream before I start talking about this particular case. And I wanted to just tell you a little bit about my history and why I'm so interested in this case. In 2003, I applied for a PI license in Maine and I was denied based on parking tickets. In 2011, I applied for a PI license in Maine and I was denied because they claimed that I was working in Maine without a license when all I did was do some training in Maine. The case was dismissed, the judge threw it out, and um, after it was thrown out, they still denied my license, claiming that it doesn't matter that the judge threw it out. After that, they called my largest client, told them that I was under an investigation that's ongoing. That client dropped me and uh, I ended up having to scramble in order to just survive that year. But I rebuilt my business and then again in 2018 or 17, I applied for a license a third time. This time, they scoured my social media and they found a comment that I made under a post and they used it against me to deny my license, saying that I was libelous against a police officer when I questioned um, a police-involved shooting where a Maine State Trooper killed two people, or was involved in killing two people. Just so happens that that Maine State Trooper was in charge of giving PI licenses to people in Maine. Isn't that quite the coincidence? The corruption in Maine is worse than you could ever imagine. Cronyism is worse than you could ever imagine. In 2003, at the very beginning of my PI career, when I was starting my business, there was a PI by the name of Ray Wood, who told me, don't bother applying for a PI license in Maine, you'll never get it. They only give licenses to former state troopers, people that are well-connected, or former law enforcement. I didn't believe him, and so I applied. But his prediction came true, unfortunately. Since then, I've learned of so much corruption that I'm convinced Maine is one of the most corrupt states in our country. More corrupt than Chicago, New York in its heyday, Boston in its heyday, when corruption was known to exist there. Because it's such a small state and the crime is so low, they get away with the corruption. The federal government doesn't want to waste their time on such a small state, such an in, insignificant amount of corruption in their view. But to those of us that love Maine, and that for me, I'd like to return to Maine, the corruption in Maine is preventing me from doing that. Cronyism is out of control. But it's not just me who they retaliated against. There was a private investigator by the name of Bobby Doyon. They retaliated against him too. Similar circumstances, the same characters were involved. A, uh, a woman by the name of Catherine Bierman they retaliated against. Very similar. Uh, Robert Pelletier they retaliated against. And now there's a new person. I don't recall his name right now, but I'll add it in. He was retaliated against. Private investigators, people that are just trying to get licenses or do business in Maine. I get stories on a daily basis now 
since I've been publishing articles and videos of people that have been retaliated against by the Maine State Police and the Maine government. The police accountability in Maine is a joke. From Lieutenant Anna Love, who's in charge of professional standards, who literally grew up idolizing police, to Brian McMaster in the AG's office, who, as far as I can tell, is sort of like the de facto AG. He's a staff employee investigator. He's been there a long time. He even has a conference room named after him in the AG's office. Former police officer who covers up for police corruption at every level in the state. It's out of control. And the worst part about it is this corruption isn't sort of like hidden in the shadows where they try to disguise the fact that they're doing these bad things. It's blatant in your face. There's nothing you can do about it, corruption. But to drive the nail home, there was a case recently where two Massachusetts private investigators went up to Maine and they worked um, assignments up there without being licensed. They were discovered, state police found out about it, interviewed them, they confessed to doing this, which is a class E misdemeanor, which is um, a pretty hefty fine, $500 fine, and you could spend up to a year in prison for it. So not they didn't do it just once, they did it multiple times. But uh, here's the kick. Their boss was a well-connected person in the state of Maine. Uh, he was on the main uh, PI association. He was friends with Michael Harrington. And uh, he knew some of the troopers up in Maine. And so what do you think happened to these two PIs that were caught dead to right? They even confessed to the crime. Absolutely nothing. They were just asked to return to Massachusetts and kindly not come back to Maine and work cases. Contrast that with uh, what they did to me in 2012 12, when uh, they made up the crime that I worked in Maine without a license and they used that to make sure that I was never licensed in Maine even though there was nothing to it. So I figured I would talk about uh, getting railroaded on a railroad. Why not? Um, but that's uh, uh, the name that I mentioned in there, Philip Castoro, Philip Castoro, um, he's a private investigator. I've, I've learned that he since passed away back in 2008, um, but uh, he was working on a case um, from the 1990s involving um, uh, Dorothy Lofortune, who then went by the name Dorothy Rule. Um, but uh, that was her mate or that was her married name her maiden name is the fortune and uh, she is a very outspoken person against the state of Maine she had a radio program back in the 80s which was um, taken down by the city of Biddeford Maine um, she didn't stop she didn't want to stop it they forced her to take it down because um, they didn't like what she was saying because she was being critical of the state police or the state the city um, elected officials and they did not like it one bit so they took her down um, I got this comment from living in tongues uh, corruption is everywhere you are so right about that 100 percent but Philip Costero was working on a report when he um, um, uh, and it's a very fascinating report. It's a little bit hard to understand, but I wanted to uh, read a little bit of that report to you. This is a report that was put together by Philip Castero, the private investigator that I was telling you about. Um, it's a little hard to read because he doesn't break it into paragraphs, or whoever uploaded it to the internet didn't break it into paragraphs. Um, but... Um, I have learned that Philip has unfortunately passed away. Um, and anyway, this report um, I just wanted to read. When you cross over the New Hampshire border into Maine, you are welcomed by a, the sign pictured above. And um, the sign he's referencing is a sign that says, the way life should be. 
After reading about the atrocities and brutalities inflicted upon Maine citizens, the violations of rights, violation of law, obstruction of justice by high-ranking officials, law enforcement, and the courts, you can decide if this is, quote, the way life should be, unquote. My investigation has been ongoing for several years. It will take time to give you all the facts and evidence of the inhumane treatment inflicted upon two innocent, law-abiding citizens who stood up for their rights. I will keep adding to this site, so please check back. About 1988, I was retained by Marion uh, Lafortune, Lafortune of Biddeford, Maine, York County, to assist her in pursuit of the wrongful death of her husband at Southern Maine Medical Center. I reviewed the medical record obtained by an attorney who, quote, smelled a rat, unquote, and the evidence does indicate a wrongful death. I agreed to investigate further. Because she was being railroaded by attorneys on a malpractice suit, she kept an eye on the court file. And she and her daughter, Dorothy Rule, who um, now goes by Doroth by her maiden name, Dorothy LaFortune, <coughs> would go to the clerk of court's office at York County Superior Courthouse about once a week for months. When documents were missing from the file, they questioned the whereabouts of these documents. The file was eventually sealed for life. In November of 1990, my client and her daughter went to the clerk's office to find out why this file was impounded. The daughter was speaking to Diane Hill, clerk, whom she personally knew, and another secretary. During their conversation, a York County Deputy Sheriff, Clifford Scott, entered the office. It wasn't unusual that an officer be around the courthouse. Mrs. LaFortune and her daughter, Mrs. Rule, left the clerk's office and were leaving the building. As they were walking through the lobby, they heard someone say, Arrest her. Deputy Scott grabbed Miss Rule, who's now known as uh, Dorothy LaFortune, um, left arm and twisted it up behind her back. She was crying and told him that it was hurting her, and he pushed her arm a little bit higher. Mrs. Rule called the deputy a bastard, and he grabbed her by the neck and threw her to the floor face down. Mrs. Rule weighed about 95 pounds and was about 5 feet tall. Deputy Scott weighed about 220 pounds and stood nearly 6 feet tall. Deputy Scott laid on top of Mrs. Rule, pressing down on her back, her leg and her ankle. He pressed her face into the marble floor, and every time she tried to lift her head off the floor, he pushed her face back against the floor. Eventually, Deputy Scott handcuffed Mrs. Rule behind um, arms behind her back. After she was on her feet, one of the five deputies watching this whole thing happen, um, and each have their own account of what happened according to the records. Deputy Mary Dowdle spoke with Mrs. Rule, and the two spoke. As the two, two spoke, Deputy Scott grabbed Mrs. Rule by the neck, pushed her up against the wall, and she went back down on the floor. Deputy Dowdle saw no reason for Deputy Scott to grab Mrs. Rule by the neck and push her violently. Mrs. Rule was then brought upstairs to a holding cell with Deputy Scott pulling on her handcuffs like a pony ride for the purpose of wrenching her arms and causing her unnecessary pain. Mrs. Rule was taken to this cell while awaiting a sheriff cruiser to pick her up. However, there was a cruiser outside before she was taken upstairs. Once inside the holding cell, Deputy Scott threw Mrs. Rule on the floor again, laid on her as he had done downstairs, and uncuffed her to take away her pocketbook. Mrs. Rule was later transported to the York County Jail, charged with assault upon Deputy Scott and criminal trespass in the clerk's of court's office, and then released on uh, personal reconnaissance. She was taken to Goodall Hospital in Sanford, Maine for treatment and x-rays of her injury. The ER doctor on duty stated that she was badly roughed up, end quote. She suffered shoulder, cheek, knee, ankle, back, and elbow injuries as a result of Clifford Scott's use of excessive force. These injuries have jeopardized her career as a ballet teacher. Notarized statements from some of Mrs. Rule's students regarding her injuries are available. The next day, Mrs. Rule went to the county, the York County Sheriff's Department to file a complaint of excessive force against Deputy Scott. Uh, Chief Deputy Jeff Houston refused to accept the complaint because, quote, would not go against one of his own, end quote. York County Sheriff Wesley Feeney would not accept her complaint either. Neither York County Sheriff Department, York County District Attorney Michael Cantera, 
Maine Attorney General's Atten uh, Attorney General James Turney, who was nearing the end of his tenure at the time and replaced by Michael Carpenter, nor Governor John McCarran, husband of Congresswoman Olympia Snow, would initiate any investigation into the abuse, excessive force, and false arrest of Mrs. Rule. An internal affairs report of Deputy Mary Dowdle, conducted by Detective Michael McElvery, now a state legislature, states the fact the facts that Mrs. Rule stated um, and that Deputy Dowdle, quote, was shocked, surprised, and amazed when she saw hands on Rule's throat. She never saw Mrs. Rule, quote, kick or strike anybody, end quote. Mrs. Rule obtained attorney Paul um, Arison to defend these charges on a false arrest and criminal trust, uh, trespass. Also, he signed a contingent agreement with Mrs. Rule to represent her in an excessive force um, case against uh, Deputy Scott. Before the trial of Mrs. Rule, her attorney received a letter from York County DA Michael Cantera willing to dismiss charges against Mrs. Rule if she would be willing to forego the civil suit against Clifford Scott and the county. Not being guilty of the charges, she refused the deal. During the trial, only one deputy, Mary Dalbo, took her witness stand. Diane Hill, clerk, and one secretary also were called as state witnesses. The accusations of Deputy Scott that Mrs. Rule hit, kicked him, yelled obscenities, obscenities at the clerk and secretary and refused to leave the clerk of court's office were contradicted by the state's witnesses. I have the court transcript to prove the perjury of Deputy Scott before Judge Roland Cole. There was no doubt that Mrs. Rule would be found innocent during a recess for the judges uh, would be found innocent. During a recess for the judge to meet with attorney Aronson and the prosecutor, Deputy Dowdle, who had just been a witness, entered the jury room. She stayed in the room about five to ten minutes. When this was brought to the attention of attorney Aronson, after his return from the judge's chamber, he did nothing. We broke for lunch. He went to his office because he did not feel good, and the trial did not resume when we returned. The trial was over. Mrs. Rule was found guilty on both charges. Her sentence, simply not to enter the court of clerk's office ever again. Attorney Aronson refused to appeal and did not represent Mrs. Rule in her civil suit against Deputy Scott and the county. Mrs. Rule had been pursuing an investigation into the assault upon her. Although Brian McMaster, chief investigator for the Attorney General's office, had stated a thorough investigation was conducted, Mrs. Rule was never questioned by anyone from the AG's office. No one saw her bruises and her pictures of her bruises. The only thorough investigation verified by court documents is a 10-minute interview from someone in the AG's office with Deputy Scott. How do you conduct a thorough investigation in 10 minutes? Since DA Michael Cantera refused to accept Mrs. Rule's complaint against Deputy Scott, and because the sheriff did not follow through in demanding the fulfillment of county investigature um, procedure on the part of the district attorney and the refusal of the AG's office to investigate, a sheriff DA AG gentleman's agreement had the effect of obstructing justice at the county and state levels in order to illegally and criminally shield York County from civil liability in this matter of police brutality. Additionally, a complaint was filed against the sheriff and Deputy Scott with the Maine Criminal Justice Academy. The complaint goes before a board and the chairman of the board is Brian McMaster. Needless to say, nothing was done. McMaster was holding position of chief investigator for the AG's office in Augusta, Maine, and sat on the MCJA complaint board in Waterville, Maine. As you continue to read facts of my investigation, the events will turn your stomach, and you'll learn how everyone in power sleeps in the same bed. District Attorney Michael Cantera covered up for York County law enforcement, the Attorney General's Office under James Tierney, Michael Carpenter, and present AG have covered up for the York County officials. Governor John McCannon and Angus King have covered up for the state officials. Pursuant to the Constitution of Maine, Article 1, Section 19.6, by the law of the state, the civil remedy of a person injured by a felonious assault and battery is not suspended till the offender has been prosecuted criminally. Nolan V. Griffin. Mrs. Rule pursued the assault upon her and retained the legal services of attorney Stuart Tinsdale. He filed a complaint in the U.S. District Court. However, 
because of the number of pages, I will attach his statement of material facts only, which will give you a good picture of what took place. When Attorney Tinsdale refused to enter evidence in the case, Mrs. Rule dismissed him and proceeded as a pro se litigant. And I have to say, she did an excellent job. Judge Brock Horn Hornby was to hear the case. However, Magistrate David Cohen, remember his name, he will come up again later, heard the case. In order before in order for Magistrate Cohen to hear this case, a consent to proceed before a U.S. Magistrate Judge had to be agreed upon by the parties and signed by Judge Hornby. It was not signed by Judge Hornby. Mrs. Rule presented her case very well despite being denied a, the ability to call witnesses, enter evidence in many sidebars. Quote, it was evident that Magistrate Cohen did not want the jurors to hear the reasons for her many objections. The jury was given a special verdict form with five questions to answer. Then Magistrate Cohen changed the verdict form to one that only had three questions. While the jury was out, both parties were called back to the courtroom and given a note from the jurors. Mrs. Rule had proven her case of excessive force, but on the verdict form, no is checked off after Magistrate Cohen dismissed the jurors. Um, he ordered Mrs. Rule not to have any contact with the jurors and gave her an order prohibiting post-verdict contact with jurors and cited United States versus Caprios. Attached is that case law and it involves mail fraud. The abuse of power and obstruction of justice is an outrage. Mrs. Rule continues her battle for justice against police brutality and will until Deputy Scott is prosecuted pursuant to the law. Although I was still working on Mrs. Rule's mother's case, I agreed to assist Mrs. Rule in the case of police brutality. I was threatened with phone calls to back off. Did I want to learn the hard way? Quote, back off, and quote, did I want to learn the hard way, end quote. I was chased through the back roads of my town, was run off the road, car totaled, and left for dead on the side of the road, bleeding like a pig. I sustained a broken nose, cracked ribs, cuts, and not a single line was published in our newspapers. I believe the following atrocities, frauds, brutalities, and violations that go beyond all bounds of decency that you will read about with documented evidence are in retaliation for Mrs. Rule and her mother's continued pursuit for justice. If justice is served, many people, government officials, and the banking system will be exposed for their dirty work. If any of you have... So the volume was a little off there. I'll give you a second to adjust the volume just in case my voice is a little quiet right now. But um, basically, uh, this private investigator, Castoro, was retaliated against for looking into this case. And um, my introduction to Castoro was... Um, uh, let's see here. My introduction to him was... Uh, uh, somebody had forwarded me a letter where it showed that he had been retaliated against um, by uh, a state police investigator, uh, Detective Gomain from the Maine State Police. And let me just play you a little bit of that um, video. I cannot believe I missed this. I just can't believe I missed this. Um, and I've even been in contact with somebody that knew about this and they didn't even tell me about it. Um, I'm not sure the person that forwarded this to me would want to know, would want his name um, um, known, but I was forwarded this recently, and this is explosive in so many ways. Um, so, as many of you know, my story of um, how I was retaliated against um, after I was critical of the Maine State Police over a Maine State Police involved shooting. Um, and um, um, they retaliated against me also earlier back in 2012 for, for um, uh, basically we eviscerated them in court. And um, I was retaliated against after that. And of course, uh, I learned that if you aren't connected, if you're not a former retired state trooper or law enforcement, they will never give you a private investigator license. They'll, they'll do everything possible to make sure you don't get one, including make up false charges and um, comb through your social media and use a very um, uh, 
we use a comment made under a post among 181 other comments out of context in order to as reason to deny your license um, and I've become aware of other people other private investigators like uh, uh, Bob Doyon Bobby Doyon um, who was a who was a private investigator in Maine but was so disgusted from the retaliation that he received that he just gave up his license and now he does other things. I think he's a woodworker or something. And then also um, Catherine Bierman, who was a licensed private investigator in Maine, who was so disgusted by the retaliation that she was intimidated to not renew her license. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, my story. Um, and what I can't mention, and I wish I could, is the dozens of other private investigators that um, have contacted me saying that they were either intimidated to not apply in Maine or they did apply in Maine and were denied. Um, I mean, it's pervasive to that a lot of big companies, like I talked with a company called um, uh, Global Options, which is a major private investigation company, that they were considering even pulling out of Maine completely, just saying, screw Maine. We're not going to accept cases there because we can't find good private investigators in the state to work the cases for us. And also, um, Ethos um, Investigation Services um, has a hard time finding investigators in Maine um, because the quality of investigators is just so bad because, for the most part, if you're a retired law enforcement. Um, but retaliation in Maine is... In, in, and I'm not saying retired law enforcement is make bad investigators. I'm just saying that once you hit to the hit the age where you're retired and you're collecting that pension, um, you just don't enthusiastically work cases the way you would as a, somebody who is not retired, like myself. I became a private investigator straight out of college because I never had a desire to be a police officer. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. I did for a little bit, but um, I, I didn't want to have to carry a gun and Whenever I would talk to police departments, they said, yeah, that's impossible. If you're going to become a police officer, you have to carry a gun. Um, I know that's kind of silly, but um, I just don't believe um, that guns help you. If you live by the sword, you die but by the sword. My sword is the Bible, not uh, not a weapon. And um, I believe in the Second Amendment. I believe you should have the right to bear arms. I just don't believe that they're for me. I, I, I have no desire to own a gun. Um, but... Um, so I couldn't become a police officer, so I became a private investigator. And it was in line with what I wanted to do anyway, because from a very young age, my goal was always to become a private investigator. I used to, when I was really young, I would tell my mom and dad, hey, I'm going to be a private investigator when I grew up. So I had a very singular focus. And it's sad with everything that Maine's done to me. They've kind of taken my belt a little bit, a little bit of the passion that I have for what I do away from me. It's, it's absolutely sad. Because now I know how dirty and corrupt it can be. Because up in Maine, it's 100% corrupt. For instance, um, the, there's an oversight committee that regulates private, the private investigation industry in the state of Maine. Um, I mean, this is an oversight committee that regulates the private investigation industry in Maine. And the chairman of this oversight committee is a guy by the name of Michael Harrington. Well, it just so happens Michael Harrington is also the owner of the largest private investigation company in Maine. How in the world can that even happen? Like I say over and over again, there's blatant in your face. There's nothing you can do about it. Corruption in Maine, and it needs to stop. But anyway, this um, letter was forwarded to me. And um, once again, it's an example of a private investigator being retaliated against, in this case, for asking questions about um, Governor Angus King. I'm going to read, um, uh, it says, uh, Dear Governor King, as a licensed private investigator for nearly 30 years in this state, I have been pursuing an investigation into criminal activity that has occurred in this state. During your first campaign for governor, you promised to meet me with, uh, if, if, you made the, if you made the election. To date, I have not been granted a meeting with you. Several letters requesting a meeting or your intervention into the refusal of the Attorney General's office to investigate my documented evidence of criminal activity, including, but not limited to, bank fraud, extortion, and, and conspiracy have been denied or ignored. Additionally, I did not appreciate a telephone call from Detective William Gomain, State Police, 
threatening my license and telling me to have no further contact with you because I wrote a letter to you requesting your help as governor of this state and used the word soul, quote, as governor of this state. You have a duty and obligation to listen to your constituent, constituents, especially where criminal activity, obstruction of justice, and abuse of power is concerned. I'm going to break in here for a second um, because what's interesting is that um, Detective Gomain, and I think he has a pretty cool name for living in Maine because it's literally Go Main, which is kind of a cheerleader for the state. But anyway, Detective Gomain. Um, I'm familiar with because back in 2003 when I applied for a private investigation license William Gomain was the one who found that I had parking tickets in Somerville, Massachusetts and denied my license over the parking tickets and one speeding ticket. So I think based on that um, Mr. Gomain is a dirty cop and corrupt because um, he obviously plays into the whole cronyism where we don't grant licenses to out-of-staters, non-retired um, state troopers, and law enforcement, because obviously parking tickets are not sufficient to deny a license. I wish I had have appealed that denial, but I was still kind of, my head was in the clouds. 2003 was when I opened my company, and I was like, I don't need a fight with Maine right now. What I need to do is start my business. So I focused on starting my business, and I didn't appeal that denial. I wish I had, because... Um, also in 2003, I was warned um, that Maine would deny my license, so I was, that factored in too. I was like, oh, well, I guess um, Mr. Wood was correct. He was a, Mr. Wood, um, Ray Wood, is a private investigator from Arista County, Maine, who warned me never to apply in Maine because I would never get the license because of corruption and cronyism. So I'm familiar with Detective Go Maine, and I believe him to be a dirty cop. Um, Anyway, and obviously is he is if he's threatening to retaliate against this PI simply for asking questions about corruption in Maine, um, which is very similar to what Lieutenant Scott Ireland did with Robert Pelletier, who called Governor LePage um, to wanting to address and uh, expose corruption in Maine, and um, Lieutenant Scott Ireland called back. Um, Mr. Pelletier and threatened him that if he called the governor's office again, there would be consequences. So threatening um, people that are looking into corruption in Maine and retaliating against people that are looking into corruption in Maine is a real thing. I know all too well because it's happened to me. Um, as governor of this state, you have a duty and obligation to listen to your constituents, especially where criminal activity, obstruction of justice, and abuse of power is concerned. On May 23, 1998, I spoke with State Rep. Michael McAlvery regarding this situation. He informed me that no investigation will ever be had while you are governor. I do not intend to wait or to continue or to continue to pursue justice until after the this year's election. I am giving you the opportunity to do what is right and what your duty as governor calls for to intervene into this matter. Failure to do so consti con, um, constitutes obstruction of justice and abuse of power, and I will pursue immediate, immediately a petition to remove you from office as governor of this state. It is time to open your door to the little guy and not just... So his letter gets a little, uh, I actually, that's a video that I made um, and posted on my YouTube channel. So just scroll down my YouTube channel and you'll see that letter and um, um, that whole video. But uh, basically the point I'm trying to make is that uh, retaliation for speaking out against corruption in Maine is a real thing um, and it's pervasive. And this private investigator, uh, Castora, was looking into this case that we just read about and I I'm starting to get a sense that maybe I'm having an audio issue but uh, just let me know in the comments uh, Troy Kabar wants a shout out Troy um, living trouble water sound let's pull this up sounds like a corrupt governor or Mr. Gomain is checking your or the governor's office mail yeah um, so very very interesting comment um, so Mr. Um, uh, Castora, this private investigator, was retaliated against simply for looking into corruption. All about this particular case. And I was kind of doing all that to build up to the fact that when you question 
the state of Maine, because there's no citizen oversight committee to deal with corruption and corrupt officials, they feel like they can get away with whatever they want to get away with. Um, now we'll get back to the case of uh, Clifford Scott. He was a, um, a sheriff's deputy that was 230 pounds and he literally beat the crap out of a 5 foot, 92 pound, 42 year old wom woman from Biddeford, Maine. He beat the crap out of her and after he did that all the forces of Corruption Inc. in Maine, the, from the District Attorney's Office to the Attorney General's Office to the Criminal Justice Academy that trains police officers to the Oversight Committees or I mean the Internal Affairs uh, Departments that look into corruption by officers, they all went into overdrive to cover up what happened to Dorothy LaFortune, a poor um, 42-year-old, 5-foot, 92-pound woman. And now what I want to do is play you um, this radio uh, parts. I, I edited I edited the, a radio interview that she did where she lays out exactly what happened to her in great detail. This is a case from the 90s where there was some serious corruption going on um, and she did a radio interview um, and I'm going to play clips of it. I had two incidents uh, of police brutality and excessive force. This involved a 1990 assault by York County Deputy Sheriff Clifford Scott in the lobby of the York County Superior Courthouse in Alfred. My mother was pursuing the wrongful death of my father, and she had retained uh, the medical records uh, by an attorney who smelt a rat. We found out that this medical malpractice case had been impounded and sealed for life. My mother and I would go into the clerk's office to find out, you know, what was in the court record. Uh, well, the day after we found out that this file was impounded and sealed for life, uh, I went to the courthouse with my mother. My mother and I both had a legitimate reason for, you know, asking questions. But, you know, when you ask questions uh, and you're right, you're going to find yourself on your face on the floor. So Dorothy and her mother were at the clerk's office asking questions about why they just sealed her father's malpractice lawsuit. They were probably upset, there were probably some words exchanged, and it sounds to me like the clerks got their feelings hurt, and this is what unfolded afterwards. We left the clerk's office and we were, were walking through the lobby to leave the building. And I heard someone say from behind me, arrest her. And I, I thought, okay, somebody's in trouble. Next thing I know, Deputy Scott is grabbing my arm, twisting it up my back. Mm. Uh, I mean, he pushed my arm so far up my back, I could touch my hair. Um, anyways, and I told him that he was hurting me, I was crying, and he pushed my arm up a little bit higher. And... Uh, he grabbed me by the neck and he threw me down to the floor. So at this point, Deputy Scott arrested Dorothy, and I'll let her explain why. Criminal trespass in the clerk's office and assaulting him. How do you trespass in a public building during business hours? So Dorothy filed an internal affairs complaint about this. They found he did nothing wrong. She then went to Superior Court, where a jury found he did nothing wrong. And then she went to federal court to file a civil rights lawsuit and once again lost there. But some in, in the litigation that unfolded, some interesting things happened. Read the testimony of Clifford Scott uh, under oath. He said that, um, you know, I was swearing at the girls, calling them names. Diane Hill's statement was there were no obscenities. He threw me to the floor. He laid on top of me. He was pressing down on my back. My in my ankle. He pressed my face into the marble floor. And every time I tried to lift my head off the floor, he'd push it back on the floor. 
Then he uh, eventually handcuffed me with my arms behind my back, and the handcuffs were so tight, I had marks on my wrist for almost a year. The important thing to note here is that Dorothy is a five foot, 90 some odd pound woman, and Deputy Scott is over 200 pounds, like 230 pounds, and he's like over six feet tall, um, just to give a little more perspective. Uh, I ended up in the outpatient after he arrested me, uh, and uh, I went to the uh, jail. I went to the hospital right from there, and the doctor, ER doctor, said I was badly roughed up. You know, he black and blued my ankle. Uh, my hands were black and blue from the handcuffs. I had a bump on the top part of my arm below my elbow the size of an egg. I had bruises on my hip, on my knee. I had to wear uh, like an arm brace around my elbow, one around my knee, and around my torso. The deputy grabbed me by the neck, pushed me up against the wall. And I, I went back down on the floor. Dorothy read this interesting quote from the internal affairs complaint um, investigation. Well, no reason for Deputy Scott to grab me by the neck and push me violently. And these are her words. Mm. I was then brought upstairs in the courthouse. It's a you know, long stairway to a holding cell with Deputy Scott pulling on the handcuffs uh, which were behind my back. Uh, he must have been holding on to my pocketbook because they were in between the handcuffs, the hands. Mm. He was holding on to that like a pony ride for the purpose of wrenching my arms and causing me more unnecessary pain. So I was taken to the cell and I, while awaiting a sheriff cruiser to pick me up. However, there was a cruiser, I, I found out, outside before I was taken upstairs. Now, once he put me in this holding cell, he threw me on the floor again, laid on top of me, as he had done downstairs, and he uncuffed me to take away my pocketbook. Hmm. I guess the keys to give my mother, the keys to my car to give to my mother. Then I was later transported to the York County Jail charged with assault upon Deputy Scott and criminal trespass in the clerk of court's office. And then I was released on PR and I was taken to the Goodall Hospital in Stanford for treatment x-rays of my injuries. And uh, um, I suffered shoulder, cheek, knee, ankle, back, and elbows, elbow injuries, uh, ribs injuries uh, as a result of his use of excessive force. So a common theme with what happens um, in situations like that is we always find out that the police officer had little to no training when it came to how to arrest somebody or how to use certain things. Like um, I did a story on the use of tasers, on the use of mace, and um, the use of handcuffs. Um, this is just another case where training comes into play. Listen to what Dorothy says here. You know, the training that they that he had, it, it really wasn't uh, that much. Uh, he had a two-week course uh, at the Criminal Justice Academy. This is yet another example of why we need police reform. But what happens next is even more uh, chilling because Dorothy does the correct thing and she goes to file an internal affairs complaint against um, Deputy Scott, who would just beat the crap out of her. It's the next day, I went to the York County Sheriff's Department to file a complaint of excessive force against him, and there was a deputy there, Jeff Houston. He refused to accept the complaint because he, quote, would not go against one of his own. I filed a complaint uh, with the Criminal Justice Academy, and that's where you file a complaint against, you know, law enforcement. And the only thing is, the chairman of that board is Brian McMaster. He's the one that takes the complaints. Brian McMaster is the investigator for the Attorney General's office who wouldn't, who would not even, you know, give me the opportunity to show him anything. They did their 10 minute investigation and that was it. Ah, Brian McMaster, his name pops up again. It's a consistent name that pops up with almost all the police corruption cases that I've run into in Maine. He is the cover-up master. 
later when they went to court, there were some briefs filed, and this passage was in the brief. The occurrence given a rise to the plaintiff's claim for relief is that while taking plaintiff into custody for allegedly trespassing in the York County Courthouse, the defendant Clifford Scott employed a degree of force on the plaintiff that was far in excess of any force reasonably necessary under the circumstances, including but not limited to slamming the plaintiff, uh, a diminutive 42-year-old woman face down on the marble floor of the courthouse, mashing her face against the hard surface, kneeing her in the back, bearing down on her back with the brunt of his 200-plus body weight, wrenching her frail arms with excruciating force, applying cuffs so as to ensure her hands and wrists, to injure her hands and wrists, grabbing her throat to choke her, digging his fingers into her neck, throwing her against a wall, and otherwise treating her with an excessive and wholly unreasonable degree of force when pushing her up a flight of stairs and shoving her into a holding cell on the second floor of the courthouse. And he goes on to say that Clifford Scott, uh, York County failed to provide Clifford Scott with adequate training with respect to the constitutional limitations placed on the use of non-deadly force and affecting an arrest. And defendant, York County's failure constitutes deliberate indifference. Dorothy made a huge mistake in this case that probably cost her. I decided I'm going to do this pro se. I'm going to do this on my own. So I put a uh, withdrawal of him from the case and I continued on my own. By representing herself, she pretty much guaranteed she was going to lose at this point. Um, that was not a smart thing to do. Um, you should never try to represent yourself. Um, when you represent yourself, the only person that's going to win in that case is the opponent, the state. The experienced attorney will always win. That's just how the criminal justice system works. They don't care about justice. They care about which side makes the better argument. And believe me, an experienced attorney is going to do a better job than you're ever going to do yourself. So this was a fatal mistake in her case. This is from the four person, the jury. It says, I am convinced Deputy Clifford, Deputy Scott overreacted, used excessive force, and acted negligently and in an unprofessional manner. However, I am not persuaded that his action was intentional. Does the content of paragraph one on page seven of the instructions therefore require me to find for the defendant? All right, here's, here's his answer to that, the judge, Cohen. On the plaintiff's constitutional claim, that is, the excessive force claim, the first of the two elements plaintiff must prove by a preponderance of the evidence is that the defendant acted intentionally. Now pay close attention because I'm going to come back with something. I must prove uh, that the defendant acted intentionally rather than negligently in committing acts that violated her right to be free from the use of excessive force against her. Thus, if you should conclude, and I'm not suggesting you should, since this is your decision alone, that the plaintiff has proved by a preponderance of the evidence that the defendant used excessive force against her, but that she not moved by the same standard that in doing so the defendant acted intentionally then you must find for the defendant and this is why you need an attorney because right here the judge actually sent instructions to the jury that were not correct when you're dealing with excessive force you do not need to prove intent that's established in the law now in cases of excessive force and intent need not proven. No specific intent to deprive a person of um, a federal right is necessary to create liability under Title um, 42, 1983. There's a case law that says 
fact that defendants had no specific intent or purpose to deprive the plaintiff of civil rights will not absolve defendants from liability if they did, in fact, deprive the plaintiff of those rights. What a fascinating case. What an extremely fascinating case. Um, in the end, she, she lost, I'm going to say, because she didn't um, stay with the attorney. Um, whenever you try to represent yourself, it, it doesn't go well. Um, and I just did broad brushes about this case as far as there's a lot more to it. Uh, there's a lot of corruption that went on surrounding this case. Um, obviously, this officer messed up. He beat the crap out of a 90-year-old, five-foot woman. And then the main corruption, Inc., went into overdrive to crush her because they wanted to protect their own. And that's I'm not sure why I said 90 year old. She was actually 42 years old um, <clears throat> when he beat her up and bruised her and caused her to have to go to the hospital and so many other things. Um, but he was, you know, 230 pounds. She was 90 something, 90 pounds. Uh, maybe that's why I said 90, 90 pounds, um, five feet. Um, and he just beat the crap out of her. And then every single level of the main I guess accountability system where after a cop beats somebody up you know they are punished or there's accountability for them failed Dorothy Lafortor every single at every single step from she did and, and she initially did everything properly like file the internal affairs complaint they, they found he did nothing well first of all they wouldn't even take it so let's um, uh, they wouldn't even take the complaint I mean and then she went to another officer and he wouldn't even take the complaint. Finally, she goes to the Criminal Justice Academy where they have a committee to deal with police accountability and um, it's run by this shill, Brian McMaster, who always finds in favor of the cops. So of course they found in favor of him once again. Let's resume this. By the way, look at this. My name is Dorothy LaFortune from the state of Maine. For nearly two decades, I've contacted many members of Congress, the DOJ, the FBI, for intervention into the abuses, atrocities, and brutalities inflicted upon me and my family. The refusal of Maine law enforcement to act upon evidence of felonies and the cover-up by state officials and judges led me to Washington for help. The same phrase is used by all of you. There's nothing I can do. I'm sick and tired of being rebuffed by those in authority who have a duty and obligation to investigate my evidence and prosecute with the evidence demands. I've pursued violations of elder abuse, the prescribing of unnecessary drugs, the holding of my mother against her will, tied to a bed so heavily sedated that she did not awaken for weeks, all covered up by the DHS. Holding the elderly hostage for lifelong care in nursing homes, placing restrictions on people's lives, isolating them from years of friendships and familiar surroundings, stealing their homes, and forever changing their lives is a public scandal. Taking advantage of the elderly and the taxpayers is big business for the DHS. My pursuit for investigations through the main Secretary of State's office and the Attorney General's office for violations of election law, the tampering of absentee ballots, and the U.S. first-class mail, this massive, destructive, corrupt, political tsunami which has hit Maine and this country has become a way of life. The security of Maine citizens is at high risk with the abuse, retaliation, and harassment of good, decent, law-abiding citizens who have sought help. You have turned the American dream into a nightmare. The masquerade party ongoing in Augusta in D.C. is known by more people than you realize. 
the political players dance from one elected position to another, wheel and deal with the connections they've made, ignore the pleas for help from their constituents who pay their salaries, then eventually climb the ladder to a higher position. The only time you give us your attention is when you want to vote or sell a book. I will not stop until justice prevails and restitution is restored. Yeah, so you can see she's gone through a lot. She's a lot older now. Um, she's been fighting for justice since that happened. She's actually gone through a few other things that I'm not going to cover here. And again, this is just broad brushes of even this story. Because after Clifford Scott beat the crap out of her, um, and then she went into the criminal justice system, she was arrested on criminal charges. So she had to fight those and dealing with... At one point, she was actually given a plea deal where um, they would drop the charges as long as she agreed not to sue them. So I, I'm not even sure that's a plea deal. They just said, hey, as long as you sign a consent agreement saying you're not going to sue us, then we'll drop the charges on you. But she was like, no way. You did wrong, and I want to get you. So um, she didn't take that deal. But, I mean, this... And then, of course, uh, she lost that trial, so she, in her attorney, refused to appeal it, so um, she uh, went to the Superior Court, she went to the Federal Court, and at every single stage, she just was railroaded, one, with corruption, with cover-ups, and with public officials that did not want to admit that Clifford Scott did something wrong. And of course, Clifford Scott remained a, de a deputy for a while um, until he was discharged for medical reasons. Um, but he was never punished. Meanwhile, Dorothy has had to live with this nightmare for the last, uh, this happened in 1990, so for the last 30 years. She was 42 in 1990, that would make her 50 to 72 right now so she's 72 years old and she still hasn't got justice she still has not been served justice for what Clifford Scott did to her when he beat the crap out of her and it seems like the same players always come into the scene from Brian McMaster who always covers up for police um, Detective Gomain who um, um, threatened a private investigator that was helping her and her mother out look into the wrongful death of her father when a hospital screwed up by giving him the wrong medication. Um, uh, he was threatened. He was threatened by Detective Gomain that w they would go after his license and they would go after him if anything, um, I if he continued to pursue his investigation. And then, of course, um, Detective. Um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, private investigator uh, Casto talks about how he was followed, um, he, he was pushed off the road, got into an accident, and basically he lays out a case of attempted murder. Let's read this here. Recently came out with arm locking with BLM and their stand to defunding the police and that they are given military equipment in exchange for puppet strings. Yeah, um, the the, the police are overly militarized in our country right now, that is for sure. Um, and without real police reform, um, stuff like this that happened to Dorothy Lafator and people like um, Deputy um, Scott are just going to continue to get away with what they're doing. Um, this is a good comment. She needs to let it go and let God handle it. Yeah, that's a little difficult because when you see corruption, then you know that those same officers are going to do things to other people. Like, for instance, I saw corruption, and I, I, somebody made that exact same comment to me when I saw corruption with um, uh, Lieutenant Scott Ireland of the Maine State Police. I made the exact same comment. And my answer was, well, if I let it go and he kills somebody, then I'll have that on my conscience. Well, later, a year or two later, he killed somebody. 
And sure enough, I felt extremely, extremely guilty about it. Um, anyway, that pretty much um, wraps up how, what I want to cover on this Dorothy LaFortune tune case um, with Willard Scott. I mean, he beat the crap out of her. The Main State um, Cover Up Corruption, Inc. went into full um, damage control mode and so much corruption happened around um, the aftermath of him beating the crap out of Dorothy. Um, just so much. Prior to Maine denying my PI license, I really was invisible. I just kept to myself. I did my own thing. I worked hard, kept my nose to the ground, um, built up my business, and then boom, I run into a brick wall of corruption up in Maine. If I hadn't have run into that brick wall of corruption, I would not be posting these videos right now. I would not be exposing corruption all throughout Maine government, pervasive corruption from that infects every aspect of the public sector in the Maine state government, from the state police to local sheriff's departments to um, industries where cronyism just runs rampant. In fact, the corruption in Maine is so blatant and in your face, it just surprises me. You know, my life seemed more peaceful and more tranquil prior to knowing that my home state, the state that I love, the state that I want to move back to, the state that I wanted to move my family to and raise my kids in, is just so corrupt. And I'm speaking to the public officials right now, the public officials, the corrupt and dirty public officials in Maine. All you had to do was give me the PI license and I would have just shut up. I wouldn't have said anything. I would have just moved on with my life. I didn't want this fight. I mean, we have to be the change we want to see in the world. And when you see corruption as bad and as blatant as I see in Maine, what choice do I have? I don't want this for myself, but what choice do I have? All right, thanks for participating in this live stream. I enjoyed it. Um, I'm super tired. I worked a long day today and then I did this research. So I probably shouldn't have done this live. Um, I may re-edit this so that it uh, comes together a little bit better. But um, I hope that you got the message that Clifford Scott beat the crap out of a 42-year-old, 5-foot, 90-pound woman. And he got away with it. And the reason he got away with it is because he knew that he could. Because he's from Maine, where there's no public corruption accountability. So after doing that live stream, um, Dorothy actually got in contact with me and told me that her radio show, she, she made a few corrections. Um, she said her radio show wasn't in the 80s, it was actually in the, uh, in the early 2000s. And she also um, gave an expl explanation for why she um, got rid of her um, attorneys. Um, she, she said that they were selling her down the river and she had nothing to lose by just going pro se and representing herself. I'd like to give a shout out to the Maine Fusion Center, a secret Maine State Police Department set up in the week of 9-11 to spy on terrorists, but now spy on anybody who's a little critical of the state of Maine. They have spied on me, they've spied on um, peaceful protesters, um, they've spied on people that were against a power line going through Maine, they've spied on uh, Black Lives Matter protesters, and they are my most loyal fan. They've watched all my videos, read all my posts. So a big shout out to the Maine State Police Fusion Center. These videos do take a lot of time. I don't make money on them. So if you would not mind, go check out my website, um, nationalsi.com. And um, if you know anybody who does insurance fraud assignments, um, insurance adjusters, lawyers, um, please, 
email me their contact information so that I can reach out to them. Um, I'm in the New England area. I'm licensed um, in uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont. I work in Rhode Island, and also I'm, I'm down in the south, too, in Tennessee. Um, um, so any of those areas are are great. If you know people that are in the industry, please forward their information. It would be very, very helpful. Um, also, check out my store. Um, you can buy cool t-shirts and uh, mugs and different things that help support my work. I just want to get to the truth. That's my goal with every case, with every um, story that I do. And um, the truth and uncovering the truth is very important, no matter where it leads. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Prior to main denying my PI license I really was invisible I just kept to myself I did my own thing I worked hard kept my nose to the ground um, built up my business and then boom I run into a brick wall of corruption up in Maine if I hadn't have run into that brick wall of corruption I would not be posting these videos right now I would not be exposing corruption all throughout main government pervasive corruption from that infects every aspect of the public sector in the main state government from the state police to local sheriff's departments to um, industries where cronyism just runs rampant in fact the corruption in maine is so blatant and in your face it just surprises me you know, my life seemed more peaceful and more tranquil prior to knowing that my home state, the state that I love, the state that I want to move back to, the state that I wanted to move my family to and raise my kids in, is just so corrupt. And I'm speaking to the public officials right now, the public officials, the corrupt and dirty public officials in Maine. All you had to do was give me the PI license and I would have just shut up. I wouldn't have said anything. I would have just moved on with my life. I didn't want this fight. I mean, we have to be the change we want to see in the world. And when you see corruption as bad and as blatant as I see in Maine, what choice do I have? I don't want this for myself, but what choice do I have?